heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Caroline Hyde of Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, we'll break down TSMC's first quarter earnings report. That's as the company scales up profit but scales back its outlook for a chip market expansion. Plus, Google fires 28 employees after they were involved in protests against Project Nimbus to provide Israel's government and military with AI and cloud services. We'll bring you the details. And Cisco's plan for keeping AI systems safe from attack? Artificial intelligence itself, of course. We'll discuss the company's new safeguarding approach and so much more throughout this hour. But first, Ed, we check in on these markets. And actually a little bit of uptick in the Nasdaq in some of those technology stocks to say we're up about five-tenths of a percent. Now, elsewhere, we'd sort of been treading water. We'd been digesting what has been quite a harsh sell-off throughout the week in stocks and indeed in bonds as we really start to digest just two cuts for the rest of the year, if that coming from the Federal Reserve. Ten-year yield still up again, four basis points. 4.63 is kind of where we currently are standing. We lost some of our technology. We'll get it back in a minute. We're currently seeing the VIX on the downside, though. So some of that volatility that we've seen in the fear index, in that gauge, just dampening down. We're down just to about 17 level. Remember, we spiked to 19 on the back of geopolitical risks at the beginning of this week. Move on, have a little look at what's happening in the world of crypto, because we had been, in fact, seeing a bit of a rebound. We're up almost 5% on the day, but look, we're still languishing at about a $63,000, $64,000 level. We're going to dig into crypto a little bit more in a moment. But, Ed, what are you watching on the micro? Well, we are going to look at Alphabet, parent of Google. The shares are higher half a percent. They have been down earlier in the session. Very shortly in the program, we're going to go to our reporter, Davey Alba, and find out about these jobs that were cut or the, the firing as a result from the protests. Very well read. Bloomberg Terminal and online. A lot of interest in that story. The chip sector is a main focus of readers again this Thursday. Uh, let's start with uh, TSMC. It's now down on the ADRs, 3.8%, have been much lower, giving us a maintenance of that CapEx guidance, very strong in AI, weakness in smartphones. Remember, this is the world's biggest contract manufacturer of semiconductors. And then a Bloomberg exclusive. Micron is softer half a percent. Bloomberg reporting that it's going to get about $6.1 billion in grants from the U.S government as part of the CHIPS Act. Grants only, but there's a loan component as well, and it could come as soon as next week. Uh, there's a lot to discuss. And for that, we go to Bloomberg's Ian King, who leads our semiconductor coverage. Let's start with TSMC. The world pays attention at the moment when TSMC gives us numbers. We learned that AI is strong, high performance computers strong, potentially smartphone is weak. What was your takeaway? Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. They've confirmed basically the, the fears and hopes of, of everybody who's watching semiconductors right now. Smartphones were down steeply and people will be concerned that that's a read on Apple and what they're, what's happening to the iPhone, particularly in China. On the flip side of that, HPC, high performance computing, which is obviously NVIDIA, AMD and all of the very large, very expensive chips were up strongly. Pair that then with the news that we had with ASML yesterday and the fact that chip equipment perhaps isn't so in demand. What is TSMC really trying to signal here? What they're trying to signal really is, you know, that as usual, they have the best read on what's going on and they're really confirming what's going on in terms of these end market forces. We've been waiting for the smartphone market to come back for a long time. It is coming back in China, but unfortunately, it's coming back for chips that are probably being made outside the Western ecosystem. So that's a concern there for the geopolitics. ASML is a longer term read on the confidence of a small group of companies. Doesn't have as much of an indication on what's happening in the short term. Ian, let's talk about Micron and Bloomberg's reporting that it will get 6.1 billion grant allocation from the CHIPS Act to build capacity in the United States. There's a loans component as well, but sources are telling us this could get announced next week. What do we know about the package Micron's been awarded? Yeah, I mean, as ever, companies want more. They want as much as they can probably get. This is being seen as roughly what commensurate with sort of Micron's role in the value chain here. Remember, they make memory chips. 
that production, as with advanced logic, has been moving to East Asia for the last few decades. This is uh, the Biden administration saying, hey, we haven't forgotten about memory. That's important, too. You need that in your phone. You need that in your data center. So they're enabling Micron to at least bring some production back to this country. And we've heard time and time again from the CEO, Mahotra, really talking about you need to make it worth my while, though. I could be building manufacturing abroad for much cheaper. Where in the US is he going to be putting it? And really, does it make economic sense? Um, it makes economic sense if you get the government subsidies. Um, what Sanjay has said all along, as you pointed out, and, and a lot of his colleagues have said the same thing, the government here needs to do the bare minimum, which is to close that gap in terms of what it costs between the US and places like Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, where those facilities are currently being made with a lot of government support, with tax regimes, with all of these things which help large capital projects like that. He's looking at upstate New York and he's looking at the home base of Micron, which is in Boise, Idaho. Bloomberg, Ian King, always on for us. We so appreciate the analysis when it comes thick and fast across the chip sector. Meanwhile, meanwhile, let's get to Huawei. It's released its latest series of smartphones today, sustaining its momentum after that breakthrough Mate 60, remember, that device that helped erode Apple's dominance over in China in that high-end segment. Now, the Pura 70 smartphone series starts at $760, then goes up from there, matching, in fact, the price point of an iPhone 15, Ed. All right, coming up on the program, Google fires employees staging protests from California to New York over a contract with Israel. We're going to have that report next. A quick check on Trump media and technology. Shares higher 14% in the session, adding to the gains of yesterday. Classic SPAC trading. There's a lockup until September, a lot of activity in Warren's market. This is the SPAC 101. We're seeing a big dip and now a big rebound. This is Bloomberg Technology. Time for Talking Tech. And in the news, Elon Musk is apologizing for incorrectly low severance packages. The Tesla CEO made the rare apology via email and said it has come to his attention that some severance packages were incorrectly low and it will be corrected immediately. The news comes after Tesla slashed global headcount by more than 10 percent as the EV maker struggles with slowing demand for electric vehicles. Plus, Apple's CEO Tim Cook is meeting Singapore's incoming prime minister at the tail end of his most extensive Southeast Asia tour in years as the company searches for new growth markets and manufacturing locations to offset headwinds in China. The trip could pave the way for a more aggressive sales campaign in a densely populated region where Android phones from Samsung, Xiaomi and the Oppo dominate the market. And Deliveroo said orders returned to growth with a 2% increase in the first quarter, driven by strong progress in the food delivery company's international segment. Users placed 73.5 million orders in the first quarter. The London-based company kept its guidance for the year unchanged. Karen. Now, there's another story that we're currently following, Ed. And Google has fired 28 employees after they were involved in protests against a $1.2 billion joint contract with Amazon to provide the Israeli government and military AI and cloud services. Now, the protests took place across Google offices in New York, in Seattle, in California, and were led by the No Tech for Apartheid organization. Google said, physically impeding other employees' work and preventing them from accessing our facilities is a clear violation of our policies and completely unacceptable behavior. Joining us now, now, we're pleased to welcome Davy Alba, who has helped report on this very sensitive story, ultimately, Davy. And the protest came a day before an all-important Israeli government approval, right, for a five-year strategic plan to transition to the cloud. It's called Project Nimbus. And this was sensitive for certain employees. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially in the, in the midst of the war between Israel and Gaza, um, employees have really been activated about this issue and have been organizing to try to protest the way that their work contributes to tools that would then serve the Israeli government, um, which again is engaged in war. And so they say that they have a right to, you know, 
band together and object to this use of their work and that U.S. labor law actually protects them um, from uh, sort of consequences from the company, discipline from the company, because they believe they are within their rights to, to, to come together over this issue. Davy, in your story, you present a very clear, clear chronology of what happened and the perspective of both sides of the situation. When I put on social media you were coming on the show, one of the questions I got most commonly was, could you tell us a bit more about the, the roles of those that were fired, what we know about those specifically? Because it was quite a broad protest, and we're saying less than or fewer than 30 people actually lost their jobs. Yeah, so um, from the workers we spoke to, several of them were software engineers. Some of them worked on cloud, and there were even some employees who were involved in speaking out against Project Nimbus, who worked for DeepMind, which is Google's AI lab. Um, you know, these these workers tend to not have specific um, visibility into exactly what Israel is doing with their technology because these contracts are so siloed, and workers don't, you know, directly work on on the tools that the Israeli government might use, but they build the tools that the Israeli government can then use for any purpose. Um, there's been prior reporting that, you know, the cloud services that the Israeli government uses is on their own instance, private instance of Google Cloud. And so from that perspective, you know, employees can't see inside of, of that cloud that's um, on Israeli soil and being used by Israeli government. Um, but these employees have been obviously following the news um, and believe that their work may be not so in a straight direct line um, but still does contribute significantly to the way that the technology that Israel is now using and deploying in the war with Gaza. When you say Gaza, actually not quite right, the war between Israel and Hamas, of course. Hamas of course. deemed, of course, a, a, an issue, a terrorist organization by the EU and the United States. Davy, I'm really interested in perhaps is this a tone shift in any way coming from the very leadership of Alphabet and indeed Google? I mean, Sundar Pichai, how much has he had to weigh in here and decide what the outcome is? Yeah, it, it, it absolutely is a shift in tone. Um, for so long, really, the founding culture of Google has been, you know, to foster this um, sense of open debate and employees are encouraged to speak out about anything really having to do with their work. Um, those were in the early days. Um, but then over the years, uh, employees have really started to band together over important social issues. Um, you know, in 2018 or so, there was organizing around sexual harassment allegations from leadership at the company and sort of the, the way that they wanted um, women to be able to speak out about their experiences. So there was a walkout um, from employees uh, around that issue. And other issues have also galvanized these employees, um, you know, in 2020 with yes. the killing of um, George Floyd and organizing around the Black Lives Matter protests. That was another issue. But this really has emerged as a particularly sensitive flashpoint for Google, this particular issue with Israel. And the company appears to be sending a message that they aren't going to tolerate um, this kind of workplace activism anymore. Davey, you, you, you talked about how the, the workforce has been galvanized. You note in the final paragraph of your report that despite the response from Google, many employees feel that they're getting support. Uh, is that happening contemporaneously? And, and is there any sense that mm -hmm. these strikes or sit-ins will continue or if this is the end of it now? It's hard to say. Google sent a very strongly worded message to all employees essentially saying this is not um, this is not something they will tolerate, that it is against company policy. Um, at the same time, you know, we've heard from employees who have been keeping an eye on 
the internal messaging that's been happening at the company and several people are actually quite upset by this move um, from the company and maybe it'll take a while for them to do another action but it's not out of the realm of possibility um, this could continue on for many more months we showed Google's full response and communication at the top of the segment and you can go and read Davy and Julia's story and see it in writing for yourself on Bloomberg.com. Bloomberg's Davy Alba, thank you. Now coming up on the show, Cisco says it's the biggest revamping of its security offerings to date. Security and AI, that conversation coming up next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Harnessing the power of AI to keep AI software safe from attack. That's the promise of Cisco's latest product, HyperShield. I want to go straight to Cisco Executive Vice President and General Manager of Security and Collaboration, G2 Patel. This is classic Cisco, right? You, you want to do more on services and software, but just explain the technology. You're going to use AI as the defense tool against an attack on AI infrastructure. Well, Ed, you know, security is actually one of the most pressing issues of our time, and AI is actually being weaponized quite a bit by malicious actors. So it only makes sense for us to also use AI effectively to provide machine-scale defenses um, to organizations. So we uh, launched what I would call probably one of the most consequential innovations in the history of Cisco in, in the area of cybersecurity in the past 40 years. And um, it's called Cisco HyperShield, and our our goal over there is to fundamentally reimagine security for this AI world at AI scale, yeah. um, because it's, 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 it's very hard to go out and handle these threats at human scale. Juju, it's been interesting because time and time again, people have come on saying, look, with AI as the aggressor, we can also use AI as the protector. You really talk about this being a radically new approach. How is it radical? How is it that new from what's already on the market? Yeah, I think there's, it's, it's important because you need to make sure that there's a certain set of building blocks that are built on top of which you can build these solutions. And we now have some very advanced technologies around hardware acceleration, around AI, that can allow us to build these very sophisticated capabilities. There's many examples. I'll give you one particular one. The amount of time that it takes from when a vulnerability is announced in the market to when an exploit happens by malicious actors is now down to single digit days. And I think I wouldn't be surprised if it goes down to hours or minutes in the next few, uh, um, in, in the near future. And so what we've done is we've actually seen that the, the amount of time it takes to patch that infrastructure is actually still 22 to 45 days. Right. So you've got this massive gap from when an exploit happens and uh, how long it takes to patch the infrastructure. And we've solved that problem. Because what we can do now is within minutes have a shield that can put in front of infrastructure that has not been updated, that has not been patched, so that you can protect the organization from critical infrastructure attacks that might happen to hospitals or financial services organizations and so on. T2, you talked about the building blocks. What we're talking about is data centers, rows and rows of server stacks. Exactly. And we know that yep. that infrastructure build out is happening. It's happened and the spend is committed for more of it. Is the spend committed to HyperShield? Is anyone actually buying this service from you in parallel with that infrastructure build out? Well, this, this was the first day that we announced it to our customers. We had about, um, we had um, many of the leading uh, you know, chief information security officers over here in the UK where we announced this, uh, this product. And the most common phrase that I heard was this is completely game changing. And in fact, one of the customers told me, I'd like to have two. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think if you care about cybersecurity and if you care about your critical infrastructure being protected, uh, it's going to be very obvious for you to make sure that you can allocate some focus on something like Cisco HyperShield. And the reality is, is this is the only one in the market. There's no one else who quite handles the problem the way that we are over here. Of course, all of this is surrounding the partnership and increasing partnership that you've been talking through with NVIDIA. How integral has NVIDIA's practice been within this? When the way that we think about this is you have to work with the ecosystem at large rather than being completely kind of a walled garden. So NVIDIA is a very important player in AI. 
And uh, we want to make sure that we partner with them so that we can build security specific models. We actually take our technology and optimize it for their GPUs. And so we will continue to work with NVIDIA and others. And NVIDIA, we've enjoyed a great partnership with them already. And this, this one just extends that further. Gigi, what NVIDIA offers is expensive. And everyone's been talking about the rush to harness chips, to harness energy, the expense that's coming with this new world of generative AI. How expensive, what can you price point your new AI cybersecurity prevention app? So the way that we're going to go out and price this is by workload. We haven't announced the exact pricing yet. This is going to be general availability around the August timeframe. And so between now and August, we will make sure that we actually have more information on pricing. But our, our philosophy is to price for mass market, right? We want to make sure that we have high unit volume so that we can get to many, many customers within a very quick amount of time. Gigi, there is a human safety net element of this. You're not handing over complete control to the defense of critical infrastructure. Just explain the safety net. The way I think about this is humans are always apprehensive of something automated taking over. And so um, remember the days, Ed, when you actually had to update your iPhone and you would actually back it up three times before you started updating it? Now you don't worry about it because there's that trust that gets built over time. And so what we've done is we've actually made sure that customers have the option of having a human in the loop. So if you do want to auto update your systems, that you actually have the ability to make sure that that can be approved by you and it doesn't happen automatically. Uh, but when you feel comfortable, you have the option of having that be completely transparent to you so that you can then start focusing on higher order bid items. Tito, you've used the word customers a lot. We just have 30 seconds, but just explain who the, the market is here, the users you're selling to. Our market is every large organization, mid-sized organization and small organization that's interested in making sure that they can protect the data centers from, um, from attacks uh, for, from a cybersecurity standpoint at AI scale. G2, so great to spend some time with you. Live from your garage, we joke, you're actually at the McLaren Center <laughs> over in the UK. We've got some nice wish, cars in I the wish. background. Cisco Executive Indeed. Vice President and General Manager of Security and Collaboration, G2 Patel. Thanks for joining us on the day of the announcement. Meanwhile, coming up, all eyes are kind of retraining upon crypto. Bitcoin's halving event. It's just in a few days, folks. We'll discuss what to expect, what it really is, what the impact's going to be. Of course, so much to be thinking about the risk assets as they have seen continued sell-off at the beginning of this week and we start to level out, see a rebound today in Bitcoin. What does it mean ahead of this key moment for the in ecosystem? From New York, from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. Ed Ludlow here in San Francisco. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. Let's get you a quick check on these markets because actually, well, still the economic data comes strong. Oh, there you are, Joel. Nice to see you. <laughs> our floor manager just um, shining a light on some of our market check. I want to go back, though, to the macro for a moment because before we get into the individual names, I want to shine a light on the fact that we have been seeing overall the NASDAQ on the higher side of things. We're up about five tenths of percent or there or thereabouts. We've also seen, of course, an introduction to the bond market, just settling a little bit. We've been seeing a bit of a sell-off. We seem to be wanting to commit to some of the individual names that are on the move today. So I'm going to shine a light on Netflix earnings coming thick and fast after the bell, up six tenths of a percent. We're expecting about a 14 percent increase in revenue for its fiscal first quarter. Netflix juggernaut faces a high bar, though, after a $112 billion rally. We've got emphasis on the downside after its numbers. Of course, Indian key player in the technology space, actually underwhelming when it came to overall revenues. We're looking at MicroStrategy, though, up more than 6 percent. Some of the individual crypto names doing well. Ed, why? Because crypto is bouncing, on the day at least, although we've seen, of course, some profit taking of late. All right, let's keep uh, the conversation going around crypto and bring in Thomas Perfumo, Kraken head of strategy. Uh, Tomas, I have been invited to not one, but two Bitcoin halving parties tonight. <laughs> Whether I go to either of them remains to be seen. But it got me thinking that for many, this is something that is interesting to be celebrated you know it's coming in the calendar. For others, they, they focus on the supply and mechanics of what it does to the market. 
where do you focus your attentions? So for me, I think of the takeaways for the Bitcoin having and falling into two different spectrums. Firstly, it underpins why we believe Bitcoin is the soundest form of money. There's a whole host of reasons why on the demand side, things like global liquidity, 24-7, 365 market access, permission, permissionless, censorship resistant, like all these nice qualities for why Bitcoin serves as a good form of money. But on the supply side, you know, how reliably can you plan around uh, a currency and Bitcoin because of the having you know that there's only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoin in existence and so on the second part of the the takeaway here is that this Bitcoin having in particular you know we, we celebrated every roughly four years but this one is the most symbolic in my opinion in Bitcoin's history and even looking forward because at a time when you have people who are looking at their conventional currencies inflation interest rates and the economic environment that they live in they see this alternative form of currency, Bitcoin, and it's something that has this really crisp story, this idea that as of tomorrow when the halving takes place, 94% of all Bitcoins that will ever exist will have been mined. And less than 1%, uh, we'll see less than 1% inflation in the circulating supply of Bitcoin going forward. So that's a really powerful story, I think, for people yes. and why the halving is so important. Tomas, there will be a big section of our audience watching, thinking, what has this got to do with me? Is there a chance that they wake up and global financial markets, the world, has been changed by this halving? No, I, the halving in of itself isn't going to be a cataclysmic event. We're not talking about a rapture here. Uh, but what it is doing is it's reinforcing the narrative of Bitcoin as sound money. And in our opinion, the adoption of Bitcoin and of crypto takes time. This is something that is a, a very innovative technology. It's very different from how people use money today. And so this is something that's going to take place over 5, 10 years, 20 years, etc. And you're going to think of it as almost like a, a change in culture and a change in understanding of how people transact with one another. And so when we think about this having in particular, nothing super special but again, like an important milestone, uh, particularly in this time and age, and we'd love to celebrate it. Tomas, I want to get a glimpse of what you're seeing in this unique position over at Kraken at the moment, because yes, the reason many have said that this halving is unprecedented is because where crypto has been priced at before, it, where Bitcoin has been at all-time highs, that hasn't happened before in the other times. But there has been money taken off the table of late. Why? Has there been new money? just like, trying to resettle when we have this risk occurrence, when we've had geopolitical tensions, why did we suddenly see such a fall in price? Yeah, so there's definitely a lot of volatility when it comes to Bitcoin in general. I wouldn't say that we've reached any kind of peaks. So historically, if we look at prior all-time highs, you start to see these mass secessions of all-time highs. So like 15, 20 all-time highs within a single month. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's when you see in volatility peak to 100% or so. With Bitcoin, we've only seen a handful of all-time highs in the last month. It is a little bit ahead of schedule versus the other three halving events we've seen, but nothing crazy or out of the ordinary yet. What I like to think about when it comes to the price action is uh, it's a momentous occasion. You know, people come in, they see the price level, they're like, I want to participate. And you, you get a little bit of that momentum play. but. Uh, we still have a lot of new entrants coming into the space. The Bitcoin ETF, for mm -hmm. example, $12 billion of new net flow coming into the, the cryptocurrency sector. A whole lot of people are coming in, signing up for accounts and buying Bitcoin for the first time. So this is just something you have to kind of space out over the long term. And you're going to have these ups and downs along the way. More broadly, how have you been thinking about that new inflow into Bitcoin coming into other parts of the crypto ecosystem? What's been interesting is perhaps in the other altcoins, we've just seen a churn, a movement within it, rather than perhaps money coming into Bitcoin and then going, oh, I'm going to play in the world of Solana now. What do you think about that movement coming from Bitcoin ETH into the other altcoins? Yeah, these rotations uh, ebb and flow, and it depends on the trend at the time. And so uh, when we see in 2020, for example, we had that momentous occasion called DeFi Summer. So everyone was going and playing around with Ethereum tokens. And the reason was because you had the maturation of those applications that had been invested in back in 2017, 2018. So they were launching, uh, you started to see the application, and the network effects built up from there. And then that led into rotation into Bitcoin, et cetera. Here, we have the halving event, the US Bitcoin ETF, as the catalyst for people getting interested. And so Bitcoin comes first. Uh, as far as other alternative currencies, whether they're tokens or other layer ones like Solana, Ethereum, 
a lot of that's driven by whatever application exists that people are starting to really adopt early on. And one of the interesting things, in my opinion, is that the last cycle, back in 21, you had tens of billions of dollars come into the space to develop new projects and whatnot. We're talking, at this point, about three years of maturation. And so that investment cycle, we kind of have these dark horses. We don't know exactly what application is going to come out, but we're really excited about it. And some stuff that's proliferating right now would be things around like GameFi in the crypto space. So we'll have to see from Bitcoin yeah. what, where it goes. Come back. It's been too, too long, Tomas Pofumo over at Kraken, he's head of strategy. We thank him for talking all things crypto with us. Now let's talk all things IPOs, because we started to get a few more. The CEO of Ibotta, Brian Leach, is joining us straight from the New York Stock Exchange. Why have you decided that for your business model, which is all about giving cash back rewards when you're purchasing groceries, maybe even your gas, why is it now the time to show your technology solution on the public markets? Thanks for having me. We think it's the perfect time because our mission is make every purchase rewarding. 60% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. 75% are financially insecure. We've given away $1.8 billion to help people make those ends meet. We've also, we've also gotten to a point in our company where we've built out a large network and are beginning to see those network effects. We've had six straight quarters where we've been profitable on an adjusted EBITDA basis, cash flow positive, net income positive. So we feel it's a great time to come to the markets, raise some money, and invest even more in our platform. One of our social media editors, Dia Martino, poses a big picture question for you around extreme couponing. She is a self-confessed Ibotta user. Is that the story you're telling the street, that amid economic difficulty or how consumers behave, extreme couponing is coming back? It's true that there are certain people who we like to think of as professional savers, Ed, on our platform. Our direct-to-consumer app has 50 million registered users. Many of them are proud extreme savers. However, it's also important to note that we power the first ever uh, manufacturer offer cashback program for Walmart for Dollar General, for Family Dollar, for Kroger. And these are much more everyday purchases occurring from people with a lot broader type of uh, background, not all of whom are shopping to the sale. They're encountering these offers as they're searching for products online, as they're building a basket. And we're able to move markets for the largest brands in the world. So it's a combination. But I do think that in environments that are like this one, inflationary, uh, as well as everyday environments, it's always something that's relevant. You know, people shop for groceries 1.6 times a week. 87% of Americans use at least one coupon a year on their groceries. So it's not a discretionary category and it's relevant in all climates. You took a risk coming to the market at this moment and it looks like it's going to be paying off. Your shares indicated at 107 to 112 being reported at the moment. You priced at 88. So having marketed below that, there's been real interest in your company. Tell us the marketing pitch now because you are very integral within a relationship to Walmart. Can you therefore get other big grocery stains on, uh, sta pr practitioners on board? Can you white label for others out there at the moment? Absolutely, Caroline. We've already begun to build a, a network with Walmart at the center. They are strategic investors in Ibotta, but we also have Kroger, Dollar General, Family Dollar, Exxon, Shell, and AppCard, which represents over 300 other grocery retailers, using our network to pull in rewards content on a white label basis. We think that that's going to be a very broad and attractive network, and it's really a network effect business. The more of these publishers sign up, the more we're able to attract advertisers to bring offers in, the more we're able to fulfill our mission on behalf of the end consumer, which is to make every purchase rewarding. Brian, what's the Ibotta AI story? That's right. AI is critical to the future of Ibotta. We are really helping to create a next generation platform for what we call performance marketing, meaning we don't charge for impressions and clicks. We only get paid when our clients sell a product. They want to put the right offer with the right amount in front of the right consumer at the right time. Gone are the days of your grandmother's coupon. This is not a one-size-fits-all solution. The level of sophistication we have is because 45% of our 800 employees are technologists, and we've been doing AI for years, using it to find personalization algorithms, machine learning, and we'll continue to invest in that, Ed. We want to be thanking you. I bought a CEO, Ryan Leach. Thank you so much. Meanwhile, coming up, well, we're Thank going to be talking to a company, Ed. Who are we going to be speaking with?
the Maven Clinic CEO, Kate Ryder. Big expansion on a fertility program, really important New York City conversation that's coming up next. Caro, some stock market news. Yeah, this is a company that, you know, we're just talking about IPOs there. One that IPO'd not long ago, not more than a few years ago, is thinking about actually going private, 23andMe. Speaking with, with Jiki, of course, the woman behind this business, up more than well, almost 50% reports that, look, she's not liking it being undervalued in the public markets. We see a pop on the idea that it might be taken private. This is Bloomberg Technology. New York Tech Unicorn, Maven Clinic. It's the largest virtual clinic for women and family health, announced that it's expanding its award-winning fertility and family building program. The company, which was founded back in 2014, has raised $300 million thereabouts. Investors including General Catalyst, Sequoia, Lux Capital, to name but a few. And we're pleased to welcome to the show Maven Clinic founder and CEO, Kate Ryder, for more. And Kate, you've got more than 2,000 clients using your product. And I want to understand when you go to them and say, you, this is the benefit that you're going to garner by offering this. What is it? Um, well, you know, clients right now are really interested in supporting their working families. And so I think it's been, you know, COVID was uh, certainly a moment where working families were really stretched. And I think in general, women's health, um, whether it's fertility, whether it's pregnancy, menopause, um, is just an area that has been so underfunded, underserved from an experience standpoint that employers really lean in to support these journeys. And so they can do that with Maven. So they can understand that they get talent, acqu talent acquisition, they're able to have retention of Gen Z and millennial. but. Are there any statistics you give clients? Like, this is the return on investment you get when bringing in Maven Clinic. Oh, yeah. I mean, fertility and maternity as a bundle are often one of the top healthcare costs that employers face. Mm -hmm. And so with us, we're a triple bottom line business. Number one, we can reduce costs in one of the most costly areas of healthcare. Number two, we can help attract and retain some of the most important talent. I mean, 45% of, um, of workers say that they really look for the fertility benefits and family building benefits at companies today to see how they're going to be cared for. And number three, from an equity lens and a health equity lens, um, you know, employers can really lean in here and solve some of, I think, our, our healthcare system's biggest challenges when it comes to supporting, um, you know, women and families on these journeys. Challenges being, where do I get this sort of advice? How do I get it for both men and women? And indeed, how do I get the right, truthful right. advice? The business that you're building, I mean, boy, since 2014, we have been through some different economic environments. How is it going? How are you seeing the adoption in the U.S. and indeed from international businesses? Yeah, well, we grew our revenues to 95 percent last year. And so okay. even though it was a year where I think there was a lot of uncertainty about the macro economy, um, this is still an area where employers and health plans um, were really leaning in because, again, there's just so much catch up to do. Um, 12 percent of our member base is international. And so that's another big area that we're seeing continued growth in, uh, you know, the the a, a multinational is looking to bring again that equitable lens to family building and across the world it's you know it's really different whether you're in a public system what the regulations are and so how do you how do you bring that same access to everybody and so you know we work we were um, we, uh, we were we were talking with our, our client Amazon about our global uh, family building benefit with them and our partnership over the summer um, and so we, we work with a lot of companies like that having birthed in the UK and the US I can attest they're slightly different Talking about your business, therefore, look, we just had Ibotta on. They've just gone public. How much are the companies that have invested in you, the VCs, saying, hey, you are doing so well with a 95% increase in revenue last year? Are you able to say, look, we're almost profitable, we should be going public? Or you're like, no, no, wait, wait this out. Well, uh, not this year, um, but, you know, I think that it's certainly where we, we would like to end up. Um, you know, for us, we're really lucky to have a board that really sees the long term. And so um, we're certainly headed in that direction. But I think uh, we there's just there's a lot of products we're still launching at the moment. And, you know, the markets are different these days than they were three years ago. And so um, we would you know, we're holding ourselves to a very high standard. Um, so for when we get to the public markets, we'll continue to grow uh, versus I think what's happened in the past with some companies where after the six-month lockup ends, you know, the, the share price kind of falls. And what about competition? Competition, I mean, honestly, our biggest competition is still the status quo. Um, you know, they're, they're, it's hard to change a build a category and change mindset. And 
um, you know, that's what we've been working on for 10 years. And I feel like we're 5% of the way into the product roadmap. But, but yeah, I would say status quo is, is the, biggest, uh, the biggest challenge. And, and it's something that, uh, you know, as we continue to see more brand awareness and more celebrities and more um, member stories around why fertility benefits matter, why menopause, pregnancy, pediatrics, um, you know, that, that's, that's, that's really helpful. It takes a while to just shift a mindset. We thank you for coming on, talking all about it as no, new products get rolled out. Maven Clinic founder and CEO, Kate Ryder. We thank her. Ed, what have you got? Okay, coming up in the program, TikTok heading to its moment of truth in Washington. We'll have all the details on a divestal ban bill that's coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Congress, it's on fast track to approve a bill aimed at forcing TikTok's Chinese parent, that's ByteDance, to divest its controversial ownership stake. Or indeed, you know, we'll have to see an exit of the business. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Alex Barinka for all the details. Now, this suddenly injects new life into this conversation. We're having a lot a month or so ago. The House is looking at fast tracking it by tying it to, well, relief or money towards Ukraine and indeed towards Israel, correct? That's exactly right. We had a prior bill um, that did basically the same thing that this one looks to do, pass in the House already. It ran into some pushback from senators who thought that the timeline for divestiture was too short. So what House Speaker Mike Johnson has done is basically put this in a wrapper with really key items like aid for Ukraine and aid for Israel, things that appeal to both sides of the aisle, and made some of those changes. They've extended the deliberation period for a divestiture to kind of satiate some of the concerns from key senators. So we do expect this to be voted on on Saturday. We do believe that this will pass the House again in this wrapper of bills. And in a uh, very D.C. fashion, the Senate and Joe Biden said that they will both quickly take this effort up if it passes the House on Saturday. I, I think there's just still so many questions on how this would work, whether it's next month, next year. You make a really interesting observation in your Tech Daily that the concern is Chinese interference, which, as you write, is largely hypothetical at this point. So TikTok's faced with a divest or ban. You and I reported last month, the month before, that the company's position is we're just not going to do it. That's right. They will push for legal challenges before this becomes a divestiture situation. ByteDance certainly does not want to actually carve out this really valuable asset. And I do expect that in that year long, um, almost a year that they would have to fight this or figure out some kind of separation, they will be fighting tooth and nail. We've heard from the company that they plan on leaning into a First Amendment argument. Uh, I'm sure that both them and their supporters will be picking apart the specific language of the bill because, Ed, as we wrote back then, this still remains a really unprecedented situation to have such a large consumer tech company actually forced to separate uh, from its owner by any country, uh, it, particularly the U.S., where the social media industry kind of has its, its home in TikTok's competitors. And what if there's a ban? You cite some data for the Center for Economic Policy Research that you'd literally have to pay college students, as an example, to delete the app from their phone. That's right. They say $59 a month or uh, over $700 a year would, is what you'd have to pay them. That's no small dollar amount for a college student. But this ban is actually not going to be paying its users to relinquish TikTok. It's almost a payment in kind. Congress is saying we'll protect you from this kind of invisible existential threat of China and their potential influence or data hoovering capabilities. Uh, so I do expect that folks could be pretty upset. But with the new deadline, there's an important distinction in timing. Had the original bill passed along this same time frame, had Senate passed the bill and Biden signed it into law, that deadline for a divestiture would have come right around the election. With this extension in timing, this actually pushes that decision into the next presidential administration, past the election, and I'm sure that politicians don't want to be making the argument right around election day to their important young constituents why they shouldn't be, you know, looked at negatively if they in fact voted to pass this bill.
Alex Barinka bringing it to us and in her tech daily. Go read it. We thank you so much. Meanwhile, look, that does it for this incredibly busy edition of Bloomberg Technology, Ed. Yeah, lots to recap in the podcast. You know where to find it on the Bloomberg platforms, as well as on Apple, Spotify and iHeart. From New York City and San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology.